be taken storage. So the vagus nerve basically releases acetylcholine at the adipocyte, binds to this M1 muscarinic receptor on the adipocyte, which activates LPL, light protein lipase. Therefore, the insulin that comes along is able to take free fatty acids off circulating lipoproteins and dump them into the adipocyte for storage. So when you're leptin sufficient and when your brain can see it, this turns on, this turns off, and you get a happy adipocyte. But when, you're, when your brain, either when your leptin goes down or your brain can't see it, the opposite occurs. Sympathetic tone goes down, you feel lousy, and vagal tone goes up, you eat more and store it. Now, insulin plays a role in this as well. So let's look at what the autonomic nervous system does to the beta cell. So here's a schematized version of the beta cell. Glucose comes in, insulin comes out. How does the beta cell know how much insulin to put out? Here's how. Glucose comes in, gets phosphorylated to gluco by glucokinase to glucose 6-phosphate, raises the level of ATP within the cell. This ATP-dependent potassium channel closes. You're all familiar with this. Okay? That causes cell depolarization. This voltage-gated calcium channel opens. Calcium rushes in. Insulin rushes out. That's how insulin and glucose are yoked together. What does the vagus nerve do to that? Well, it does three things. First thing it does is it binds this M3 muscarinic receptor up here, which is coupled to a sodium channel. Now, if you activate that sodium channel and the cell's at rest, what happens? Nothing. Because potassium is the current of the beta cell. You open the sodium channel, basically nothing happens. You haven't changed the current. But if you add glucose, close that potassium channel while the sodium channel is still open, then you, what you end up with is an augmentation of depolarization. You get an decreased, uh, increased depolarization, which means you get a widening of this voltage, you get a calcium channel, you get more calcium rushing in, activating calmodulin, and therefore more insulin extrusion, all for the same level of glucose, an insulin hypersecretion. That's not all that the vagus nerve does. Down here is another M3 receptor, and it's coupled to phospholipase C. It takes its uh, substrate, phosphatidyl and acetyl pyrophosphate, and divides it up into its two components, diacylglycerol and inositol triphosphate. DAG activates protein kinase C, which phosphorylates this protein here called MARCS, meristolated alanine-rich protein kinase C substrate, which activates calmodulin, and there goes more insulin. IP3 goes to the endoplasmic reticulum, where there's intracellular calcium stored up, frees it up into the cytosol, so you get an influx of in free intracellular calcium, which also activates calmodulin, and there goes more insulin, and yesterday we learned all about GLP-1. The vagus nerve innervates the entire intestine. Here are these L cells. They make GLP-1. The GLP-1 goes to its receptor, activates adenylcyclase, stimulates cyclic AMP, activates protein kinase A, and more insulin. In other words, everything the vagus nerve does is designed to make your pancreas make more insulin because the vagus' job is to store energy. It is your energy storage nerve. Everything it does is designed to make you take up more energy and store it. This is shown in patients with hypothalamic obesity. This was work done by Jill Hamilton's group. So you're looking at the first phase and the second phase of insulin secretion in craniopharyngioma patients against obesity, and notice way higher in the cranial patients. Notice insulin sensitivity, no difference. So they're not insulin resistant, they're insulin hypersecreting. And when you insulin hypersecrete, you store more energy. So an aut autonomic function in hypothalamic obesity is very clearly defective. In response to defective central leptin signaling, here's what happens. You get a reduced sympathetic activity with decreased lipolysis, decreased gluconeogenesis, decreased skeletal muscle conversion of T4 to T3 because that's sympathetically driven through PGC1-alpha, and therefore decreased energy expenditure. On the vagal side, you reduce mitocardial oxygen consumption. You increase adipocyte insulin sensitivity by increasing LPL at that M1 receptor. You increase insulin secretion through the mechanisms I just showed you on the beta cell, and therefore you increase energy storage, all for the same number of calories. You're screwed. Bottom line. And this is what happens when you don't see your leptin organically. What do you think happens when you don't see your leptin functionally? Same thing. And that's what we're dealing with. That's obesity. Now, Attempts to try to control weight in hypothalamic obesity give us information about what sh we should do about 
garden variety obesity as well. So here's the list of things that have been tried for kids with hypothalamic obesity. Okay, I'm going to focus on just a couple of these. First one I'm going to focus on is dextroamphetamine. This is work done by Lillian Meacham and Tom, uh, Patrick Mason at Emory, where they did a, a double-blind placebo-controlled trial with before and after dextroamphetamine. You can see that the weight change was significantly improved, and the reason is because the dextroamphetamine acted as a peripheral sympathetic mimic. So it actually increased uh, skeletal muscle uh, 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 adrenergic tone right at the muscle. So using uh, medications like Ritalin or uh, uh, Adderall that are centrally acting don't work, but using dextroamphetamine can actually help stabilize weight because it gives your body a chance to burn energy. We pioneered the use of the drug octreotide. Let me show you how that works. So here's that same beta cell I showed you before. The object is to try to reduce the calcium influx because more calcium in, more insulin out. Well, it turns out that voltage-gated calcium channel is coupled here negatively to this somatostatin receptor, this SSTR5. And we have a somatostatin analog at our disposal called octreotide, normally used for acromegaly. We decided to use it for this disease. So our initial pilot study done in 1996 was to assess insulin secretory dynamics in such patients, to assess the efficacy of octreotide in reducing insulin release in these patients, and to assess the efficacy of octreotide in promoting weight loss in these patients. Eight patients in our pilot study, here's what happened. Three patients lost a lot of weight and a lot of BMI. Two patients, moderate amounts. Three patients, at least they stabilized, they didn't gain more. Remember, George Bray locked his kids up for a, a month and gave them 500 calories a day, and they gained weight. Our patients lost weight. But something even more remarkable happened. Within a week of giving them this medication, the parents were calling me up and said, Dr. Lustig, I don't know what you did, but I've got my son back. Huh? Well, he's exercising. I mean, he's interested in things. The kid would say, this is the first time my head hasn't been in the clouds since the tumor. It's kind of amazing. Okay? One kid became a competitive swimmer. Two kids started lifting weights at home. One kid became the manager of his high school basketball team, running around collecting all the basketballs. These were kids who had absolutely no interest in anything. Here's their insulins. Baseline, 300, 400, 500 microunits per mil of insulin. Okay, three months of drug, knocking it down. Six months, peak insulin, 114. Normal. And here's the change in weight here on the x-axis against the reduction in insulin over the course of the study on the y-axis. And you can see that a nice uh, uh, correlation. And you'll notice leptin went down showing that indeed there was fat loss. We did a double-blind placebo-controlled trial because obviously this was very interesting, and we were particularly interested in the quality of life questionnaire. So we ended up with 20 patients from all over the United States, 13 with craniopharyngioma, the quintessential hypothalamic obesity tumor. The weights were 97 kilos, the BMI 36, morbid obesity in children, annualized weight gain of 16 kilos per year in a pediatric endocrinologist's hands. And here's what happened. Drug, stabilized. Weight, uh, uh, placebo, kept going up. BMI, same thing. Here are the d insulin dynamics. We got rid of the whole first phase of insulin secretion on drug, whereas for placebo, we did nothing. We were interested in this question about quality of life, so we built a quality of life questionnaire into this study called the Pediatric Cancer Quality of Life 32, which has four domains, cognitive, physical, psychological, and social functioning, and here's what happened. Placebo, nothing as you'd expect. Octreotide, the kids noted slight improvements in psychological and social well-being, and the parents noted significant improvements in, physio in physical, psychological, and social functioning when we did the intergroup comparison, physical activity. These kids were more physically active. And the change in quality of life here on the y-axis correlated with the suppression in insulin on the x-axis. In other words, if we got these kids' insulins down, they felt better. Why? Because they weren't storing it. They had it to burn. Here's a patient, 100 kilos here. Pineal germinoma, here she is at 78 kilos. Here's another patient with a glial uh, astrocytoma. Here, BMI of 28, six months on drug, down to 24. Study was over. Insurance company wouldn't pay for drug. 
Here she is in her swim togs. This was the girl who tried to be the competitive swimmer. And here she is two and a quarter years later, and look what her BMI did. We finally got her drug. BMI went down to 27. And here was the proban patient I showed you before, 164 kilos, down to 126. First time he's took a picture with his shirt off. And this is a more recent one. I love this. This is not my patient. This is a girl who had a subarachnoid hemorrhage in Hawaii. Uh, I gave a talk there two and a half years ago. They introduced me to her, as you can see down here. Okay. They started her on octreotide. She's been getting octreotide injections every month, and she just graduated high school, and here she is. Pretty impressive. So what's going on here? I would pose to you that this is how you should look at all of obesity. Each of us is really two compartments. There's you, your heart, your liver, your lungs, your brain, your muscles, your kidneys, your lean body mass, which burn energy, and then there's your fat, which stores it. Now, the substrate for both compartments is glucose. But glucose is never at substrate saturation for both compartments. That means there's a competition going on. Which compartment gets the glucose? What determines which compartment gets the glucose? Well, your insulin does. Because when your insulin's high, it all goes to your fat. Now, normally, your fat would then make leptin. Your leptin would go to your VMH. Your VMH would say, hey, I don't need to eat so much. I can burn energy better. I can eat less. And therefore, food would go down, glucose would go down, insulin would go down, and more would go to you. And here's a nice negative yin-yang energy balance paradigm that we understand. However, in these kids, because they can't see their leptin, because of the CNS insult, their vagus nerve is in overdrive, driving extra insulin, and of course their sympathetic tone is down in the sewer, therefore they're not burning anything, and so everything goes to fat, nothing goes to you, you feel like crap, and you keep gaining weight on 500 calories a day. You give up triotide, you block that, you have a chance to make the glucose go to you, and you feel better, and you can exercise and lose weight. Metabolic perturbation reversed. Now, I'm going to finish up with other things you can do. So how about bariatric surgery? This has now been tried. This is work that Tom Inge did at the University of Cincinnati. A 15-year-old bo healthy boy with fatigue, somnolence, and vomiting. He ended up with a supercellar mass, ended up having a craniopharyngioma, developed panhypo pit, and developed massive hyperinsulinemia, and gained unbelievable amounts of weight. He gained 140 kilos in two years. And here's his BMI curve. Here he is at 22 when he was 15, when he was diagnosed. And here he is at 65 in two years. This is pretty impressive. They part, put him on octreotide through work you know, that I had uh, suggested to them. And you'll notice that they were able to at least stabilize. This kid didn't lose, but he at least stabilized. And you'll notice, look what his insulins did. This was pre-treatment. This is on treatment. They got rid of that whole first phase of insulin secretion, just like we did. But this wasn't good enough. The patient hadn't lost weight. So they sent the kid for a ruin y gastric bypass. And obviously, that's a big concern, because nobody knew if it would work. Here's what happened. They went ahead and did it. Here are the meal challenge insulins before treatment. Here's after 10, uh, seven, 10 days, and here's after 7 and 14 months. Basically got rid of all the insulin from the ruin y gastric bypass. And here's the BMI curve. Here's where the bypass occurred. And the kid had an EWL, excess weight loss, of 25%, which is not bad. It's still not great. But he's still at a BMI of over 50. So did it work? Yes. Was it, did it reverse the entire process? Well, no. This was work done by Hermann Mueller in uh, Germany with his craniopharyngioma database. They've sent four kids for laparoscopic adjustable gastric banding. And you can see that pre-op, their BMIs were pretty severe, and they showed some weight loss with banding as well. And we have been pioneering vagotomy, laparoscopic truncal vagotomy. So vagotomy has numerous reasons for uh, 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 thinking that it might have a, 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 a role in weight loss. First of all, decreased acid production, increased gastric tone, therefore fullness occurs earlier. Dumping syndrome is a problem, but we don't want that because that's a, a, a big issue, but it certainly discourages high sugar content foods. Reduction of energy into adipose tissue because of the vagal re, uh, effect on the adipocyte. And interrupted ghrelin sensation. It turns out your ghrelin doesn't work when you cut the vagus nerve. You need both the ghrelin and your vagus nerve to interpret hunger. 
So there are lots of reasons to think vagotomy might be worthwhile for obesity, and there's actually a history of it in the adult literature. Started with Dragstedt in 1943, who did an open truncal vagotomy plus pyloromyotomy for ulcer disease. That's where all of this started. And these patients lost weight, but only the obese ones, not the thin ones. Open truncal vagotomy for morbid obesity was done by John Kroll back in Sweden, and he had weight loss out to five years with very minimal sequelae. And since then, there have been anecdotes of truncal vagotomy for hypothalamic obesity, suggesting that maybe there was a role in it. We chose not to do a pyloromyotomy. We chose to keep the pylorus intact, because the pylor cutting the pylorus is what gives you the dumping syndrome because the food goes through the stomach into the intestine too fast, and that's what generates all the hormones that do the dumping syndrome. We did a, a laparoscopic truncal vagotomy study in adults between the UC UCSF and the University of Rochester, 30 patients, and here's the mean weight loss of 9 kilos, mean BMI change of 3, and an EWL of se minus 17.6. Point is, it wasn't great. I'm not suggesting you go out and do vagotomies on your normal uh, obese patients, but at least it worked and it was durable. That's what I'm saying here. The question is, could it work for these kids with hypothalamic obesity since they have increased vagal tone? So we got CHR approval, three, and we did four children. Here are their insulin excursions. Look, 600, 800, 1,000 microunits per mil. This is insane. They're putting out insulin hand over fist. Here are their insulin dynamics. Here's their insulin secretion. You can see this is normal. This is what these kids were doing. Their insulin resistance actually wasn't that bad. They're insulin hypersecretors. They're not insulin resistant. And here's the data on what happened during the, the, the procedure. So here's their BMI pre, and here's their BMI post. And you can see they all did pretty well. And here it is plotted on a BMI curve. The arrow is the time of the surgery. So down, 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 down. Their A1Cs went down. You say, wait a second, your insulin's going down. Shouldn't your A1C go up? No, because insulin drives receptor downregulation. So when you get rid of the insulin, your receptors come back, and actually all the patients ended up with improved A1Cs. Complications, two patients with burping, two patients with some diarrhea, none with dumping, none with dysphagia, none with vitamin deficiency, and all said they'd do it again, all of them with reduced hunger. So, in conclusion, hypothalamic obesity results in defective leptin signaling, which manifests in two ways. Sympathetic reduction, which reduces lipolysis and energy expenditure, and vagal activation, which increases insulin secretion and energy storage. When you can't see your leptin, your brain thinks you're starving. It's that simple. So let me give you a way of thinking about this that you can explain to your patients. Let's take Dr. Proietto sitting here in the front. I'm going to pick on you, Joe. He eats 2,000 calories a day. He burns 2,000 calories a day. He feels good. It's a normal day. Is he going to gain weight, lose weight, or stay the same? Stay the same, because he burns what he eats. There's nothing to store. Now, let's do a little experiment. I'm going to admit Joe to my clinical research center, put an IV in his arm, tape it down, and every time he reaches for food, I'm going to pump him full of extra insulin that he didn't want or need. I'm going to over-insulinize him. Same thing we do to all our diabetics.